to uh, today's uh, seminar. Uh, we have this one. Yeah. Jay Chopra, fresh from Washington, D.C., tell us about uh, the um, lessons in uh, Ireland's financial crisis. Jay uh, is at the Princeton Institute, been there about a year, and, but before that he had about 30 years at the IMF uh, working on surveillance and also uh, program, IMF program work pretty much all over the globe, as I can tell. And uh, your most recent part uh, was, was in the European Department, where you were, uh, I quote, part of the IMF's uh, senior management team of that department, which I was also part of. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you were closely involved, but you were the mission chief for the Irish program, which began in 2010, and uh, which is now more or less resolved. So hopefully we're going to hear that it's uh, been a success case for which there are lessons for other cases which have been less successful. But anyway, I won't, I won't uh, carry any longer. I'll hand over to you, Jay. Thank you very much, Adam. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I just want to start by paying tribute to Max Watson. It was Max Watson who invited me to come do this seminar way back last autumn. And I'm very grateful to David Vines and, and Adam for following through on that invitation. Uh, Max was my uh, mentor at the IMF for many years. I worked quite closely with him. Uh, he's very much missed. I can imagine if he was here and doing the introduction, the glee with which he'd do it. And then he'd also ask these incredibly difficult questions that as of Max is missed. Uh, I should also say that, uh, you know, even though I ended up uh, becoming the public face of the IMF in Ireland, uh, this was very much of a team effort. Uh, there were a number of us that worked uh, on Ireland, and I just want to give a shout out to uh, two individuals. One of them is uh, uh, my friend and colleague uh, Ashok Modi, who is now at Princeton, uh, and the other is uh, Craig Beaumont, who uh, took over from me and saw the program through. So I think all the successes go are really due to, to Craig. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, the lessons from Ireland's financial crisis. And uh, just to give you a snapshot right at the beginning of what I'm going to talk about, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about you know, the different narratives that are out there about, to describe <coughs> Ireland's uh, crisis and its recovery. Uh, and, you know, uh, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about these adverse feedback loops, especially uh, the loop between the sovereign and banks. Uh, we'll then talk about some of the issues that we confronted as we uh, needed to repair uh, the banking system and stabilize it after a, a systemic crisis. Uh, and of course, you know, the banking crisis also then led to uh, a, a, you know, problems on the fiscal front with, a, with an explosion in the fiscal deficit. Uh, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about how uh, you know, the issues we face in, in getting public finances back uh, uh, to stability. Now, all this was happening in the context of what was happening in the rest of the euro area. Uh, so uh, 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 we'll talk a little bit about you know, the euro area policies and how uh, those influenced uh, what was happening in Ireland. And then we'll try to pull it all together by talking about a few lessons. Okay, the, the alternative narratives. Now, what you hear from uh, several policymakers in the Eurozone it goes something like this. Uh, you know, Ireland did its homework. That's, that's a term that's often used. It did its homework. It, did its, it reformed. It did fiscal consolidation. And that's why it's growing. Uh, so... If other countries, and other countries here, yeah, the people are talking really about Greece, if other countries do the same, uh, they'll, 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 they'll also uh, end up growing and be successful. So you hear this view not, you know, uh, from a number of officials, many in Germany, but it's not just in Germany. You actually hear them from, sadly, some officials in Ireland and also some officials in, in Spain. And, and, you know, I think the reason for this is that they both have center-right governments that are facing... Uh, problems from the left, and you know the last thing they want to be seen as doing is supporting uh, a, a leftist government in uh, in in Greece. So uh, I think it's a bit unfortunate uh, because I think this approach could backfire, uh, and uh, uh, so 
I, you know, I, I wish that they were, uh, they were more careful, and it's, it's also not obvious that this approach would actually protect them from the left. But, but the basic point is, this, this narrative, uh, actually I've used a polite word over there saying it's misleading, it's actually wrong. This narrative is wrong. I mean, that, that, that's not the, that, that's, that is not the story about, uh, about Ireland's boom and its bust and, and, and its recovery. So, so well, what is the story? I, I, I'll give you what, what I, the way I see this. Now, Ireland had a huge property boom in the 2000s, right? Uh, this property boom, when the bubble burst, there was a spectacular bust. Uh, the bust led to a banking crisis, and, and you know, this banking crisis led to a massive increase in debt uh, because the government had to bail out the banks. And it also led to a huge deterioration in the fiscal accounts because uh, revenues had been based on, uh, 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 on property and stamp taxes and so on, and, and, and all that collapsed. Now, as Adam said, the EU IMF program began in December 2010, but the bust actually started well before that. The bust started in uh, three years be before, the, uh, before the program started, back in 2008, uh, because there was a collapse in, in construction and investment. Uh, there was also a shock to consumption as, as savings rates uh, uh, surged. Uh, there was fiscal austerity that started even well before the program, and there was a credit crunch. Uh, so, uh, you know, just to put this in perspective, between 2007 and 2010, so the, the, the bubble burst, you know, around the time of, of Lehman's, real GDP fell 9.5% between 2007 and 2010. And it's not just real GDP that fell, there was also deflation. So nominal GDP fell by about 16.5% in, in those two and a half years. Uh, and employment fell by over 12%. I mean, actually, the construction sector lost 60% of its jobs. Um, so, so what? So, now, in in this situation, what, what was the policy focus? I'll come back to the point about bank the bank funding run uh, because that that's quite important. But I, I, I will come back to that. Uh, the focus was on uh, trying to stabilize the situation, and 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 uh, that meant dealing with the banks, and that meant dealing with the. Uh, the fiscal problem. So structural reforms were not a part of the program. I mean, there was no real need for structural reforms. Uh, the, uh, 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 the Irish labour market was already very flexible, uh, and, and you know, there was some modest sectoral wage adjustment uh, uh, reforms, but, but not much else in, in terms of the, in, uh, in terms of the, the uh, uh, supply side reforms. Uh, now, of course, sticking to the program itself and, and policy implementation, that was quite important. The Irish uh, approach to this was uh, to, to uh, under-promise and over-deliver. Uh, so, so they always met the conditions, and, and that did, did help with, uh, with confidence. Uh, so, you know, so the story for Ireland has nothing to do with structural reforms, in my view. So what? That, so carrying on, what, what, as I said, you know, the Irish economy is is highly open and it's uh, it's very flexible. So when you had the boom, resources moved into construction, and when the bust came, resources moved out of construction, uh, and and uh, you know they moved back into the traded goods sector, uh, and so they moved from a low productivity sector back into a high productivity sector, and that includes com uh, competitiveness. Uh, now uh, what? There, there was obviously a lot of labor shedding from construction, as I just, uh, as I, as I just mentioned. There was a small decline in wages, uh, and I think, I think this was more, more a decline for new hires, if you think about the private sector. Wages in the private, uh, in the private sector for new hires did, did, uh, uh, did fall, and this turns out, turns out that this can be quite important for multinational locational decisions. And you know Ireland has been very attractive in terms of attracting multinationals. Uh, there was also very large pay reductions in the public sector, uh, which did influence uh, private sector wages. Uh, but I think there's mixed evidence of wage flexibility uh, for existing workers in in, in the private sector. Uh, now the other important point is that you know as as resources move back to the back to the uh, 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 traded goods sector. Uh, and they began exporting, 
Ireland was very lucky that its main trading partners were growing well. The UK began to grow, uh, and the US was growing. They, 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 although they have a fair, reasonable chunk of exports that go to the Eurozone, I mean, a lot of their exports are directed to the UK uh, and, and to the US. So what happens is that, you know, as, uh, as you have an export-led recovery, uh, slowly this leads, begins to lead to an, an increase in investment, and it also ends up leading to an increase in consumption, uh, so it becomes more broad-based. The recovery does become more broad-based. I do have a picture that sort of illustrates this. Uh, many of these pictures that I've taken, uh, you know, one thing I can tell you about the Peterson Institute is we don't have a whole lot of support from research assistants, so I've taken many of my charts from existing IMF reports. Um, uh, now, what this, what, this report, uh, what this chart shows is, is the, the uh, uh, you know, during the Celtic Tiger years, uh, how, how exports increased as a percentage of GDP, uh, and then during the, during the boom, uh, uh, exports declined and, and competitiveness worsened. Uh, and then, you know, when the bust came, uh, for the reasons that I just mentioned with the re sectoral reallocation and a little bit of wage flexibility, uh, uh, you know, competitiveness improved and, and exports went back up again. So basically, uh, 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 this, this is an economy that reoriented itself uh, from being, uh, 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 you know, based on construction and property back into being uh, based on, on, on traded goods. Uh, so, uh, so... That's why I think the, the, the typical European narrative about what's happened, what happened in, in, in Ireland uh, is, is, is not correct. But I think it's, it's important to emphasize that uh, there was a huge human cost to this, this crisis. I mean, you know, it's not, not such a pretty picture that, you know, you have a boom, you have a bust, and then you have a reasonably quick recovery. Unemployment shot up. Not as much as in some of the other countries, because you actually did have more, a little bit more wage flexibility, so you had some price adjustments, not just quantity adjustments. Uh, so unemployment did, uh, peaked at about 15% in 2012. Uh, the most recent number is around 10, 10 and a half. But what's most encouraging is that there is fairly solid employment growth. Uh, so uh, uh, you know, the economy is generating jobs now that, uh, now that the recovery is broadened from just the export sector. Into, into domestic demand as well, and, and this employment recovery is, is, is apparently quite broad-based. Um, uh, but, you know, within this picture, youth unemployment is still very, very high, and long-term unemployment is about half of the total. So, uh, you know, and, and, and there's also been outward migration. The outward migration is falling, and, and in, interestingly, this, and it's no surprise that this outward migration is not to other Eurozone countries, it's to, it's to uh, okay. English-speaking countries, Australia, New Zealand, uh, 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 here in the UK, Canada, the US, uh, and actually the Irish government very recently uh, uh, launched, I think this was last week I saw in the FT, they've launched this new program to, to uh, attract the diaspora back mm -hmm. to Ireland, so uh, they're actually making quite an effort on this. But you know the combination of emigration, which is the safety, uh, which is a, a pressure valve in a sense, uh, and and long-term unemployment and youth unemployment. I mean, you know, uh, uh, nobody's really measured the hysteresis effects over here. But you know, I wouldn't be surprised if this does mean uh, you know some hit to to long-term potential growth. Uh, I would expect that not just in Ireland, but I think that's very true for the uh, for the euro area as well. Uh, so it's had a, uh, had a very substantial human cost, but also, I mean, you know, people talk about the, 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 the smart Irish recovery growing 3-4%. They've actually, since 2012, they've grown above the euro area average, but in per capita terms, it's still well below uh, the, uh, 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 where things are in the euro area. Uh, well, uh, what, this, what this chart shows is that it's, re it's based everything, it's per capita GDP which is the important measure in my view because of <coughs> migration and so on. Uh, everything is centered in 2007. You see Greece had a total collapse, uh, 26% and some recovery now. Ireland is the green line, uh, uh, no, Ireland is the orange line. The green line is actually Italy. Italy is not doing very well. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so the, the red line and the, uh, the orange line 
uh, are Spain and Ireland. Only Germany is well back, uh, about, uh, well above its, its pre-crisis peak. And, and you know, for the euro area as a whole, while the UK and the US and actually also non-OECD, uh, non-Eurozone OECD countries uh, returned to their pre-crisis peak back in 2012, the euro area is not going to do that till maybe 2016, if you're lucky. Right, so, so its output is still below, below its, its previous peak. Uh, so I think I think one does need to to uh, to look at that to keep this this recovery uh, in perspective. Okay, now a, a few words about about these uh, pernicious feedback loops. I mean, you know, what was happening in Ireland is is a, you know you've got multiple weak balance sheets, and after the property boom, the banks went bust. They they made a, lots of bad loans. Uh, the government had to bail them out, so that messes up the government's balance sheet. Uh, uh, the government then starts with austerity. Uh, this affects the household balance sheets, uh, affects companies' balance sheets. They all start saving more. Uh, 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 households take a bit hit, big hit. They can't repay their loans. Companies can't repay their loans. That affects the banks, and it just goes around and around. Uh, so, uh, you know, in this sort of situation, uh, the, pro the way you design a program does need to take these, these uh, interactions very much into account. And, and, and I think maybe my next slide uh, might illustrate this point a little bit better. Um, the, and, and, and this one focuses primarily on the sovereign uh, government loop, uh, what some people correctly, in my view, call uh, a, a doom loop uh, between, between these two. Uh, so, the systemic banking problem started in 2008, uh, and the government at that time, uh, uh, you know, took a number of steps. They had a near bank blanket guarantee uh, in September 2008. This is right after Lehman's collapse. Uh, they also did a capital injection of about 30% of GDP. This was uh, uh, in, in the first couple of years. They nationalized two failed banks. Uh, they moved all the large property loans into an asset management company called NAMA, National Asset Management Agency. Uh, uh, they moved something like 74 billion dollars, a billion euros of loans uh, to NAMA at, 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 at a fairly deep discount. But, you know, what happened, uh, th these, these steps that they took were not viewed by the market as being, well, let's put it this way, the market didn't know how large the hole in the banking system was. They, they had multiple cracks at this and the numbers kept going up. So the market just didn't believe, uh, 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 believe the Irish authorities in terms of uh, how big the hole in the banking system was. And uh, uh, you know, uh, the concerns about the, uh, the cost of, of bailing out the, the banks uh, started to grow. And that's when the uh, and and th and that's when uh, uh, the sovereign lost lost access. There were a couple of other things uh, happening around that time. Uh, people might remember in October 2010, uh, Sarkozy and Merkel went for a walk on the beach in Deauville, and they talked about the possibility of uh, haircuts on sovereign uh, on sovereign uh, uh, debt. Uh, a, a terrible term, it's called PSI, which means private sector involvement, I, 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 you know, a real euphemism, but uh, you know, basically it just means sovereign debt restructuring. Uh, and so then people started to worry, you know, uh, 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 what's the position of the Irish sovereign? Uh, you're also, uh, uh, the, the other thing that happened, and this is in my next slide, it, sh it shows that ECB funding for Irish banks shot up. Um, so Irish banks lost market access. They could not roll over. They, they had relied on wholesale funding to fund this property boom, and they could not roll this over. After the guarantee expired, a number of uh, 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 you know, these loans started falling due, uh, these bonds started falling due. They had to be repaid. And, and of course, you also had pr uh, other deposit outflows, primarily from the corporate sector. Uh, corporates started pulling out their deposits. So come September 2010, that's when uh, uh, these repayments started, and that's when ECB liquidity support uh, uh, shot up, and, and the sovereign uh, lost, uh, uh, lost access as, as the, as the um, uh, uh, 
as, as the true costs of this, this crisis have started to become more apparent, and as people started pulling out uh, their deposits uh, from, from the Irish banking sector. The ECB funding during this period was, uh, was about 40% of GDP in just this short period. Uh, and remember that the Irish banking system is completely reliant on the, uh, on, on, on the ECB, and the banking system was huge. It was about five, five times GDP. It was a completely bloated, uh, 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 bloated uh, banking sector, and it became completely dependent on ECB liquidity support. I mean, some of you may have heard of the famous letters written by um, uh, Jean-Claude Trichet to the Irish authorities in November. These got published by the ECB uh, late last year, uh, after a number of freedom of information requests by Irish journalists, and and uh, you know these letters are, are are really quite amazing. And you know this is this has been a big part of the discussion in Ireland that the ECB forced Ireland into a program. Now my reading of the letters is that you know if you're the lender of last resort and you see this this sort of happening with with with, uh, uh, with your liquidity support. I think it's perfectly reasonable for you to ask the borrower, what is the condition of your banks? Are they solvent? And do you have a plan to, to make, these, you know, make these banks whole? And I think that any lender of last resort has to be asking those questions and also be saying that, look, if you can't, if you can't recapitalize these banks by borrowing on the market, you'd better get an international rescue loan to, 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 to recapitalize your banks. We can talk about you know, the Eurozone policies on that in, in a few minutes. But that's not what the letters said. The letters actually <coughs> pressed Ireland to do fiscal consolidation. It pressed them to, to undertake vague structural reforms without specifying what these were. And that, in my view, is an outrageous overreach by a central bank. That's not their job. Their mandate is to meet inflation, their inflation goal, and if you tell, if you, if you lecture the ECB about how they might go about that, they, 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 they talk about their independence, but when it comes to lecturing others about fiscal policy or structural policies, they're, they're, they're not, not at all hesitant to do that. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, 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 I'm not surprised that there are people in Ireland who are very upset about uh, these, these letters from Trichet, but at least they are out in the public. And, and actually, if you look at them on, on the ECB's website, you'd see that the ECB has its own narrative on why those, those letters have to be sent. Okay. So what? So you know, you have you uh, uh, you have this massive outflow. You have basically a banking run. Sovereigns lost market access. Uh, banks still in, in trouble. So it's natural that they call in the IMF. They call in in the. Can in I the just partners. ask that? Sure. You said the, by the end of that period, that's roughly forty percent of GDP. That's right. Yes. Thanks. Yes. From nowhere in all. From nowhere. Yeah. 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 There were, there, there were other open market operations and so on going on, uh, but this is direct liquidity support to actually, uh, you know, fund the bank run, um, uh, because uh, uh, there, there are different measures of, of ECB exposure, but they, they have exposure other ways. Yeah, these are cumulative exposure too. Right? Uh, uh, the others do, of course. Yes, yes, yes. In, in addition. addition. In addition. In addition. Yes, yes, yes. But but actually, if you look at if you look at a comparative chart on that. I don't have it in this presentation. Ireland at this point stands out more than anybody else, much more than anybody else. Okay, so that's when they call in the the you know uh, the single writing on the wall, and they call in the IMF and and the EU partners, uh, the eurozone partners, primarily uh, uh, not EU, more the Euro uh, eurozone, and that's when a program was put together and you know. Uh, 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 so what, what were the, the objectives of this program? I mean, the first, the immediate need was to stabilize the banking sector and to stabilize this bleed that was happening uh, in, in, in the banking sector. Now, the IMF as a lender, I mean, you know, uh, uh, we do like to, my former institution does like to get repaid uh, uh, and, and uh, to, 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 to have some sense that, you know, the repayment will take place. 
<coughs> there should be a time frame from which you know, the official loans get replaced by your know, re-entry into capital markets and being able to fund yourself. <coughs> so the eventual objective, and this wasn't an immediate objective, the eventual objective was getting back into markets. And uh, uh, so what would that need? I mean, to, 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 to get back into markets, you know, <coughs> you know, no investor is going to come back and, and, and buy your paper unless they think you're going to grow. Uh, unless they think that you're, you're, you stem the rot in your financial system and your debt is, is, is sustainable. And we'll, we'll come back to, uh, to, to many of these, uh, 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 these things. And the overall program was uh, 85 billion euros. And, and what's unusual in the Irish case is that there was an Irish contribution as well. I mean, they had done some things right during the boom. Uh, they did put, have a rainy day fund. Uh, with, uh, uh, the uh, uh, a misnomer National Pension Fund and NPF, uh, but it really was a rainy day fund, and they used that as well. And actually, uh, they also used the rainy day fund to to fend off uh, uh, attacks about their corporate tax rate and the Finns asking for collateral and so on and so forth, uh, <coughs> putting some of their own money in. So uh, I now now turn to uh, turn to the. Uh, to, to fiscal and banks, but starting, starting with banks. As I'd said, you know, this crisis started in 2008. They had multiple bites of the cherry in trying to fix the, uh, in, time, in terms of trying to fix the, uh, the, the banking system. They, they'd uh, put in quite a bit of money already. Just wasn't believed. You, had, uh, you still had the bank run. So our approach was that the market would need to be reassured that <coughs> it actually identified the hole in the banking system, that there shouldn't be any more major surprises. There can always be surprises, but there shouldn't be any more major surprises uh, that will that'll, that'll come in. Uh, so uh, given, given that the initial measures lack credibility, uh, one needed to get a picture of the true state of the banking system. So. Uh, we came, and, and here, you know, uh, 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 this part of the program was designed much more by the IMF than, than the partners, and we could come back to this when we talk about the euro area. Um, because we had a number of people on our team who actually had experience closing banks, and you know, we had people from the FDIC and so on uh, uh, on our team. And so, so the, the first step was to do a thorough asset quality review that would be done by an outside group, and it was BlackRock Solutions that was selected. They won the tender to do that. Uh, uh, so, the, and the, there was also a stress test. Uh, uh, the base, uh, the, the uh, core tier one hurdle for the baseline scenario uh, was was ten and a half percent. The feeling was that you had to tell the market that these guys are well capitalized. Um, uh, and in the stress scenario, they had to meet a, a, a hurdle of six percent. Uh, so uh, that, that led to uh, you know additional costs for uh, for capitalizing the banking sector. Uh, the Irish, uh, uh, the central bank put out a, a fabulous report uh, in March when when these when when the results became known, which was really seen as a model of transparency, and and the whole exercise was seen uh, as as much more credible. Um, ECB funding <coughs> continued uh, during this period. Uh, I should point out that you know when, when the program was agreed, there was no ex ante <coughs> commitment from the ECB to continue its funding. No ex ante con commitment, even though you know we as partners would have liked to have had that, they were unwilling to give any ex ante commitment. Ex post, of course, they did. They did continue uh, 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 to to fund uh, the the banking system and eventually deposit outflows. Sorry, for a period of time, and then the deposits flow. I, 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 you know, before you go on, could you explain those three numbers? In a okay, little yes, bit I will. Uh, okay. Now, uh, remember that the, the government had already injected 30% of GDP into the banking system, right? So, in this exercise, <coughs> they focused on, uh, and, and a lot of that went to Anglo-Irish, which was a rogue bank and completely bust. This exercise focused on what the Irish call their pillar banks, which are Bank of Ireland, Allied Irish, and PTSB, uh, Permanent Trust uh, Bank. So for these three banks, in the, the stress tests that were done, 
with those hurdle rates that I mentioned, 10.5% in the, in the, in the uh, base case, 6% in the stress case, the capital needs identified came up to 24 billion euros, which is about 15% of GDP. And the way they funded this uh, was the taxpayer put in 16.5 billion. Uh, they, did, they did impose haircuts on subordinated debt, debt, uh, bondholders. And we'll come back to this point uh, when we talk about senior bondholders. So subordinated bondholders did, did uh, uh, get losses imposed on them. They did this through an, op uh, you know, an option uh, uh, you know, with the threat that if you, don't, if you don't tender your paper, you get nothing. And it worked. So they did. Uh, 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 now, you, uh, obviously, you'll notice that these numbers don't add up to 24. Uh, 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 the reason they don't add up to 24 is that some of the injection was done through COCOs. So that you didn't actually, incre you know, uh, uh, you limited the increase uh, in, in, in the debt by doing the cocoa. So, so uh, this was one of the first, uh, you know, in a rescue operation. I mean, Lloyd's had done cocoa's over here in the UK. They were probably the first um, uh, in 2009. I remember right? 2009, 2010. I can't remember. Um, uh, but uh, this was sort of, you know, as part of a sovereign operation. This was the first time. Uh, that the sovereign had injected uh, cocos, and, and that, that's what made up the difference. Um, and you know, all this was put out very transparently. Uh, uh, now, I think I, 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 what I was going to say is that you know, I wish, I, 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 in retrospect, I should have had a chart with the spreads over this period. But um, try to visualize the following. In, during that period where you had the where you had those uh, uh, the bank run. The sovereign spread jumped up to, and, and, and the, uh, the sovereign lost access. The, the, the spread when they lost access was between 600 and seven, spread to German bonds mm -hmm. was 600 to 700 uh, basis points, right? The program gets approved in December. Spreads with the program approval fall maybe 100 basis points, right? We didn't get that much from, from that, uh, from just program approval, because still nobody knew what the cost of the banking sector was going to be. Things in Europe start looking bad, January, February, spreads go back up, and they get back up to the 600, 700 level. March 31st, they announced the, the results of these stress tests. Spreads come down 120 basis points, so back down to the mid-500s, right, or close to 500. So this was March, April, when, when spreads had come back down. Between March, between April 2011 and July 2011, spread shot up to 1,200 basis points. I mean, you know, that's when the euro area crisis was intensifying. And so you know, at that point, whatever Ireland was doing was insufficient, was completely <coughs> overwhelmed by what was happening elsewhere in the euro area. And eventually, a year later, in July 2012, that's when Mario Draghi announced the ONT and so on. Uh, but uh, you know, this, 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 this program just wasn't going to work unless the, uh, 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 the euro area was also doing the right thing. Okay, bank repair. What, what are the issues that we faced uh, when uh, with repairing the banks? Um, I've got three listed over here. The first is the famous issue of um, you know should should uh, uh, should the should the senior bondholders uh, also uh, have losses imposed on them? As I told you, the sub debt holders, the junior uh, bondholders, did have uh, did have haircuts. Uh, we'll, I, I will talk about that in some detail. Uh, the second is the issue of uh, uh, loan uh, resolution. This is really mortgage arrears and how to, you know, uh, so you might recapitalize the banks, but you also have to deal with their borrowers. Uh, the third is the pace of deleveraging. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, uh, this was a bloated financial system, banking system, as I, as I said. It needed to be downsized. The word we used in those days was right-sized. Uh, not, not downsized. You know, you know, you know, uh, I wasn't allowed to say, my, my media people wouldn't let me say downsized in public, I need to say right-sized. Um, so there's, there's issues over there. Now, the thing is, the banks have been stabilized, but they're still weak. Now, in, in the interest of time, I'm going to fo focus on the first two of these trade-offs. Uh, later on, if there is time, you know, <coughs> answers, we can talk a little bit about the bank deleveraging. But I think the first two are more interesting. Uh, all I'd say about bank deleveraging is that the initial stage of the program, the ECB was gung-ho about fast deleveraging. Even 
because they just wanted to get repaid. Uh, uh, so they, they, they wanted the system to deal, uh, the Irish to sell assets. But they quickly realized that they, they hired some external consultants and, and who, who, who did some number crunching for them and convinced them that it would have been counterproductive. So they did, they did back off uh, on the pace of, 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 uh, of deleveraging. Um, burden sharing with senior creditors. Okay, this has been one of the most contentious issues. Um, and, and the reason is that, that, that it's contentious is the IMF staff, right from the beginning, was very much in favor of, of imposing losses on senior bondholders. The EU partners, our EU partners were dead against, especially the ECB was dead against. The Commission was initially on the fence, but they, 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 they quickly joined the, the ECB. The reasons uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 we were in favor is that I mean, most fundamentally it just reduces the cost that the public sector has to bear. Uh, it reduces moral hazard, it's more equitable. And, and we thought the, the, the reason given by the Europeans was exaggerated. Uh, yes, there would have been spillovers, but uh, you know, if, you looked, uh, if you looked at spreads on the senior debt at that time, they already suggested that, that uh, uh, the market was expecting principal haircuts on this. So you know, uh, it, it would not have been so much of a disaster. But the Europeans were just terrified about the implications for bank funding markets. Uh, if the EC, you know, so, so the ECB could have also stepped in and said, look, we will, for sovereign banks, we'll just give liquidity support. And that, that, that's, that's what a central bank is for, to, to deal with these, these, these sorts of spillovers. But that's not what they did. The cost was imposed on the Irish taxpayer. And I think the fundamental question is, why should the Irish taxpayer cover the cost of addressing these spillover concerns in the rest of the euro area? I, I think it's quite unfair. The economics doesn't make sense, yes. Can I ask a question about size? I carry around in my head that this was 6% of GDP. Is it that was, number? no, uh, well, when the previous, when, when the guarantees expired, in the first round of the guarantees expired, and uh, uh, they'd been imposed in September 2008. They expired in September 2010. At that point, the debt, the relevant debt, was about 16 and a half billion euros, so closer to 10 percent of GDP. Closer to 10 percent of GDP. Now, the optics of this was made even worse because, as we'll talk in a minute. minute the extent of fiscal adjustment that they had to do in nominal terms was also about 15 billion euros. So the extent, and now of course they wouldn't have got 100% from, from imposing haircuts, and you know, who knows what they would have got. I think the market was implying maybe 50, 60% uh, uh, haircuts. Uh, but uh, you know, they'd have saved a substantial chunk relative to the fiscal adjustment that they had. They, they ended up doing, and this, this became very, very visible. Um, uh, so, uh, instead, I should mention that you know there was an election in February uh, 2011. The previous government got kicked out. The new government, the the uh, 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 Fine Gael and and Labour coalition, campaigned on on uh, on uh, uh, imposing losses on senior creditors. Uh, when the stress test results were announced on March 31, at that point, a lot of this had got repaid already. But there was still, and, and the new government made the decision that they did not want to impose these losses on what they called the pillar banks. So Bank of Ireland, an allied Irish, they thought needed to maintain counterparty relations with other banks. So they did not want to impose uh, 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 losses on on the senior creditors for those banks, but they did want to do it for, uh, for Anglo-Irish, which was, which was a defunct bank at that point. It just hadn't been put into liquidation. And that, at that point, was about three and a half to four billion euros, uh, which, is, which is exactly the amount of fiscal adjustment that they had to do in 20, well, actually half, about two-thirds of the fiscal adjustment that they had to do in 2011. 
a, 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 a quick story over here. Remember the, the, the Irish um, stress test results were released March 31. And um, so next day is April 1. The, our team had been working non-stop, very, very hard, April Fool's Day. I wanted to send around an email to the team saying that uh, U2 was going to ho hold a concert, burn the senior, the bondholders concert uh, in Dublin and that we'd all been invited. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I, I was told that that would have been a very, very bad idea to, to send out that email, so I didn't. <coughs> okay, mortgage arrears. Um, now, the banks have been recapitalized, but they just sat on this capital. They didn't do anything with it. They didn't restructure the debt, right? Uh, now, the, the, you know, so, so as I said earlier on, you know, there's, uh, uh, they moved the big loans to this asset management company, but the small debtors, uh, they didn't really deal with these debts uh, in any meaningful way for a number of years. Now, I think there's, you know, there were historical and political constraints over here. I think, you know, that the whole issue of from the colonial era of repossessions and being people being kicked out of their homes, especially if they're owner-occupied, was very difficult. Uh, the government took some, it took them some time to sort of wrap their brains around this. That you know, unless you had a credible repossession threat, uh, you know, uh, it, it, uh, 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 this wasn't going to work. There were legislative changes that needed to happen. Uh, uh, you know, put in a personal insolvency uh, uh, law. Uh, there were some adverse uh, 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 high court judgments uh, that made it very difficult to do repossession, so they had to uh, really change the legal framework to get that done. Uh, so this, this, you know, so, so basically banks just sat on the capital. I think there's another reason, apart from the legal and uh, 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 the politi getting the political consensus, banks are set up to lend. They're not set up to, to do workouts of bad loans. So just the operational issue of bringing in experts who could do these workouts, who could set up these workout departments, hire the right people to do it, all that took time. Uh, so the Irish get criticized, and I think correctly so, that you know, they were slow to move on this. Um, I, think, I, I do think there's something to that. They could, they could have done a few things faster. They could have been more sort of supervisory control. The, supervi uh, the supervisors could have forced more provisioning. Uh, got better, you know, uh, uh, got on the case of banks to, to do this, uh, but it, it took it took a couple of years. But ultimately, they did uh, they did get around to it. They set targets for mortgage mortgage arrears uh, a resolution after the re uh, legal reforms uh, took place. But you know, I think we need to recognize that there are no quick fixes uh, in in this area. But uh, you know. Again, I don't want to paint too bad a picture. McKinsey came out with a report recently called Debt and Not Much Deleveraging. And they actually gave the Irish kudos that you know, they managed to reduce their household debt uh, by 33, uh, uh, base, uh, 33 percentage points. But uh, uh, you know, uh, a household debt in Ireland is still very, very high. OK, uh, so with these high debts, you've still got, you know, you've got rising, uh, 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 rising NPLs. Uh, non-performing loans. So, you know, as you can see, the, uh, uh, you know, it may have stabilized. We don't know. We don't have the data for the most recent data. It's, it's still extremely high. There's no credit growth. So you sta they stabilize the banking system, but the banks aren't intermediating. They're still not intermediating. They're not profitable. Uh, uh, they're, they're, they look well capitalized. You know, these are nice looking capital ratios. But once you look at how much they're provisioned and what the NPL ratios are, if you look at what people call the Texas ratio, uh, 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 which is uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, impaired loans to the sum of provisions uh, uh, and, and core tier one capital, it's, 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 it's over 100%, which is a predictor of, of, of banking trouble. Incidentally, the Dallas Fed a couple of years ago came out with a paper uh, so in the, the stern Texas ratio uh, 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 has its, uh, derives from the SNL crisis in the 1980s, which is when people came up with this ratio, saying that it's a good predictor of bank failures. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, Texas didn't have as bad a crisis this round as, say, Florida or other, uh, other places did. And, and so the Dallas Fed put out a paper saying, maybe it shouldn't be called the Texas ratio anymore, it should be called the Florida ratio <laughs> or the Georgia ratio, but I, it just doesn't have the same ring to it. Yeah. How does that Texas ratio compare uh, to the country? analysis 
uh, with the stress test. Yeah. They gave them a very positive yeah, outcome. So that's the thing. That the stress tests are based on capitalization. And there's a hurdle rate for capital. You meet that hurdle rate for capital, you pass the test. That's the downside about stress tests. You've got to go beyond that. And, and you know, uh, the stress tests also build in profitability projection. Uh, 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 so that profitability projection does take into account your embed assets and you know, the charges that you've got to take on all of this. But you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, stress tests are not, you know, they're, they're, they're one of the tools, but they're not the answer to everything. I think one needs to take a much bigger picture of the health of your banking system. Okay, I think I'm running a little longer than I hoped. Fiscal. Okay, here I've got a comparative chart. On the left-hand side of the chart, I show the cyclically adjusted primary balance for, for the five GIPs. Um, and as you can see, Greece is a huge outlier over here. Right? The, uh, 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 I'm comparing uh, the cyclically adjusted primary balance in 2009 to 2014. These numbers are taken from the latest IMF fiscal monitor. They put out these numbers every year, uh, every six months. Uh, but Look, I, I'm sure you, you, you will say that you know, these measures of st structural uh, balances or cyclically adjusted balances when you've got these huge fluctuations in output are, are very suspect, right? And, and you'd be absolutely right. I mean, you saw that earlier chart about you know, uh, 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 how much output had fallen. And also, these measures don't tell you how citizens' well-being is captured. And I think a better measure of that is to look at real per capita primary expenditure, again, per capita terms. And, but what that tells you again is that Greece had to adjust much more than anybody else. Right? So Ireland did quite a bit of adjustment. And as I said, actually, a lot of the adjustments started two years before uh, the EU IMF program was put in place. So actually, if, you'd say, if you add in the adjustment that they did, in 2008-2009, that 8.7 is actually over 10. Uh, uh, so Greece did a fair amount of, 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 of adjustment, but I just wanted to show the scale of uh, Greece's fiscal adjustment relative to others, and I think the more telling number is on the right um, in, in terms of what's happened to real, real spending. Okay, what are the fiscal issues that we faced? I think the most important one was what the pace of fiscal consolidation. Uh, uh, on this, this is another area where there were big disagreements between the IMF staff and, and uh, the Europeans. The ECB was gung-ho, wanted massive front-loading fisc front fiscal consolidation. Uh, the Commission was a little bit more, uh, uh, more pragmatic. But again, they were, they were bound by the EDP, the excessive deficit procedure, in reaching 3%. So that was their anchor. So the whole discussion became, and, and, and also I, I should point out that the Irish had also come out with their national recovery plan, and they were also quite aggressive on the fiscal front. So the Irish and the ECB were trying to get, to, to get back to 3% uh, uh, from, from over 10 uh, uh, by 2014. Uh, we were pushing for you know, a couple of years more than that. We had to end up compromising. Just one year was added. Uh, to get to 3%, it was 2015 this year, and they, they, they'll actually end up meeting that. The other thing is that we were pressing for auto, uh, 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 full allowance for automatic stabilizers, and uh, so we were not focused on nominal deficit targets, and we were also not focused on cyclically adjusted balances, because we couldn't measure those well. So we just focused on discretionary adjustment relative to a baseline. And that discretionary adjustment of those four years was 15 billion euros, <coughs> which is uh, uh, around 10% of 2010 GDP. Quite a bit. Still quite a bit. Uh, uh, but you know, that, that was our anchor. The, the nominal number of euro adjustment, discretionary adjustment relative to a baseline that you have to do each year. Also complicated because you have to agree on a baseline. Um, I think in the interest of time, I, uh, uh, Composition of adjustment, we let the Irish choose. It was primarily expenditure-based, two-thirds expenditure. Um, uh, I think that when the new coalition came in, they would have liked to have more on taxes, but they had to compromise as well. I think they would have liked to raise the personal income tax even higher, made it even more progressive. Uh, they did strengthen fiscal institutions. They put in place a fiscal council. Actually, their fiscal council was very hawkish. 
but uh, um, uh, they, they put in place a, a, a fiscal responsibility law. They also did a comprehensive spending review modeled on, on, on the UK. Um, on on, on uh, public debt dynamics, I think, I think you know, here, as I've taken this chart. This is an IMF scenario. This is not my scenario. It's the latest IMF scenario. And I think the point here is that austerity will, will help you with your public debt dynamics, but at a cost, and sometimes at a huge cost. What this scenario is showing is that in the baseline, the dark line, the black line, in the baseline, if Ireland was to raise its primary surplus from around half percent right now in 2015 to 3.5% by 2019, you'll have debt coming down to around 100%, right? So that's still a lot of adjustment. Uh, the fiscal monitor that I mentioned shows scenarios that, again, you know, the, the, the Europeans have a fiscal compact saying everybody should get back to 60% by 2030. To get back to 60% by 2030, for the next decade, the 2020 to 2030, they had to run a primary surplus of 4.5%. Now, there's a recent paper by Barry Eichengreen and, and uh, Ugo Panitza that sort of shows that these are crazy numbers. They're just not politically sustainable. And uh, except for the most exceptional circumstances, they don't materialize. I think it is plain foolishness to have these arbitrary deadlines and these debt targets. And yes, you want debt on a declining path, but to impose a 4.5% primary surplus in these countries is nuts. Actually, right now, my preference would be, would be that the entire euro area runs a deficit of at least 3%. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, QE is not enough. It's very good. But, you know, market conditions are so benign. They should all run, you know, if you're above 3%, 3 you don't have to do anything more, suspend EDP. If you're below 3 go up to 3 especially Germany. But even, you know, I, I see no case for this. So, uh, you know, I think... I think uh, some of the, the EU rules are very arbitrary and they lead to uh, bad fiscal policy. Okay, this brings me to euro area policies. Not much left, sorry, I'm going on a bit. Okay, this first quote over here, it's actually something I said at a press conference in Dublin in uh, July, before, before uh, Draghi's OMT announcement. Uh, no, no, actually, a year before, because I'm talking July, uh, July 2011. July 2011. Okay, uh, you know, soon after, soon after the stress test came out, I was in Dublin, had to do a press conference, uh, along with my Troika partners, and I did have uh, a media expert with me. And just the day before the press conference, uh, Joe Stiglitz publishes an op-ed in the Irish Times, and the headline of this op-ed is the EU IMF program is a noose around Ireland's neck. First thing they teach you in media training is don't repeat the premise. And we knew a question would come up. Is, is this program a noose around Ireland's neck? So change the metaphor. And oh, actually, he went on and said that you know, this, this, this is a, an invasion of Irish sovereignty, etc. Right? Noose around Ireland's neck. And, and suspension of their sovereignty. Okay, we knew the media was going to ask about this. So, April press conference, that's not what I said in April, I said this in July. April press conference, we said, didn't repeat the premise of statements, but we said, this program's a lifeline for Ireland, and what I said, and it represents, and it's an Irish solution to an Irish problem. I had not done my research, neither, neither had the, the a media expert. This phrase, Irish solution to an Irish problem, has an unfortunate history in Ireland uh, to do with uh, contraception in the 60s. Uh, you can look it up on Google. Uh, and so I, you know, there, there, there were some titters in the, in, among the press corps. Uh, and, you know, later on I find out that I've really put my foot in it. Uh, so the next press conference I had, uh, and, you know, as I said earlier, uh, you know, the spreads had shot up to 1,200 uh, 1200 basis points by then. So it was very easy to turn it around and say, you know, what we need is a European solution to a European problem. And sadly, that European solution was, uh, was, was slow in, in, uh, in coming about. 
I think the main point I want to make over here is, um, well, once they did OMT, things calmed down, as you know. But just before OMT, in June 2012, a month before OMT was announced, they, they made all these announcements about banking union, that they'd launch a banking union, and they raised the possibility of retroactive uh, bank recap, including for the Irish, who had been performing well. Once OMT came in, they forgot about all this retroactive bank recap that would have been done through ESM. So I would, and, and the worry about, the worry those days about OMT was that it would lead to moral hazard, countries wouldn't do the adjustment. I actually think the moral hazard went the other way. They didn't actually do the architectural changes that they needed uh, to make it a, more, a better, better union, a better, a better monetary union, uh, uh, and, 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 and that's where the problem was. I think in a, a retroactive, uh, or, or even any type of bank recap instrument uh, would make a lot of sense. Uh, the other thing uh, uh, is, is uh, the excessive focus on uh, deflationary structural reform instead of demand stimulus. I talked about that when I talked about fiscal. Uh, Kevin O'Rourke over here at Oxford who told me, um, sadly, he couldn't be here. Uh, he's written a paper with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, Alan Taylor that goes into this issue about, uh, uh, about asymmetric ad ad adjustment. And, and for a long time now, uh, 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 the ECB has not been meeting its inflation mandate. So all these countries have had to adjust with inflation with, with the ECB well below its inflation mandate. And, you know, this would have been so much easier. Uh, okay, the last, the, last, the last bullet point over here, this is a new acronym. Uh, the Greeks have told that there's no more Troika, so it's now called TIFCAT, which is the institutions formerly known as Troika, because uh, they're called the institutions. Uh, sorry, I'm being a bit cheeky over here. Um, uh, but look, we had to work with the with with, with the, the uh, our European partners. Um, we have fairly good working relations, but it it took a lot of effort. A lot of things had to be first negotiated with the Europeans before we could negotiate them with the Irish, and and that just took time. And also, to be honest, they did not have the experience of the technology. Yeah at the beginning of, of this process. I mean, I remember telling tales, uh, being in a meeting with the Irish uh, supervisors, and, uh, and an individual from one of the European institutions said something that was very stupid. And uh, the I actually, it was, the, it was uh, the Irish went out and hired foreigners, including a couple of Brits, to help them and, uh, with what they were doing. And this guy just shot them down and said, uh, actually, uh, 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 the, the person who made the stupid comment made this comment and then ended it by saying, but I'm not a bank supervisor or a bank restructuring expert. And the, uh, 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 and, and the person from the Irish side who happened to be British said, it shows. Oh. You know, uh, 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 I, I felt, at that point, I felt very proud that I had experts who had actually restructured banks in Latin America, in Turkey, in the U.S., I had you know these people behind me, you know, who'd done this stuff. They closed banks. The ECB, the Commission, just were not set up for that at that point in time. So we, you know, we drove a lot of the agenda uh, at that at that point in time. Um, okay, um, I think in many ways I've already sort of touched on many of these lessons. I think you know, in a systemic banking crisis, you need to, uh, uh, you know. You, I, I, in any crisis, the basic dictum is identify the losses, allocate them, and move on. Well, that's not happening in Greece. Um, uh, and, and it took a while for that to happen even in Ireland. Right? They had multiple bites of the cherry, but we finally got, got that done. Uh, and, and here, again, you know, it's not, uh, to move on, as I said, this banking system is no, not profitable. It, uh, it does mean it's not just a matter of recapitalizing. Uh, it means much more than that, dealing with bad debts. Uh, but as I said, you know, this is easier said than done. Uh, the second one, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the fact that, that no losses were imposed on, on senior creditors, I think, uh, you know, uh, creates huge political problems. Not only is it bad economics, but it also creates big political problems. And, and you know, it's making it harder to sustain fiscal adjustment. I mean, adjustment fatigue sets in much earlier. If, if, if the burden on the Irish taxpayer had been less, 
I think you know the politicians could have made a better case for uh, 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 to 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 uh, to avoid that. Uh, the third is look. I know that the euro area is nowhere close to being a transfer union. That's just not going to happen. It's not going not on the cards for a long time. But I think they could have done something more limited in the, on the bank sovereign loop. And and I wish I wish they had followed through on that. Uh, I also think that um, you know. Uh, 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 Slow and steady fiscal consolidation can work. Uh, there's some in Ireland who wanted to move even faster. I think that would have been a huge mistake. Uh, and you know, finally, I mean, this is a government that um, uh, you know had ownership of this program. Many of these elements have been designed by them and implemented by them. Uh, and I think that's critical uh, to get, to actually have the policies uh, implemented. They also managed to maintain social and political cohesion. They had a change of government, a new coalition, uh, and, and, and you know it's only when you have this sort of social cohesion uh, that you get that you get the the commitment. And they persisted despite some uncertainty and some very dark days, especially early on. They did persist. So let me stop there. Thanks. Um, I'd like to